So where's the little... So like I said, chapter one is just an introductory chapter. And uh, like I said, there's no assignment related to it. Uh, although there might be for the online students, so scratch that if you're listening at home. Um, we might give you more work. Uh, this is just, I think we got a pretty good introduction to what ethics is in the sense, in that sense, uh, with the first readings about ethical philosophy. Um, mostly what you figure out as you read and study all these ethical philosophers and, and the things they have to say is that the more you read about it, the less certain you are about what, not necessarily about what you believe, but about what applies in a given situation, right? Because there's so many different ways of thinking about what's right and what's wrong that it becomes challenging to use, you can't use the same rules all the time. What seems to work really well in one situation doesn't always work well in another. If you're like me, you've probably had times in your life when your personal morals have been pushed. Right? Self-defense situations. People who are typically nonviolent might suddenly feel the need to be violent to protect somebody or protect themselves. Um, maybe you believe fundamentally that stealing is wrong, but you have a situation where you're like, is that really stealing or is it not? I'll give you an example. I'll give you two that I face in this job that sounds silly. Number one, textbook companies send unrequested textbooks to faculty members, hoping that we'll adopt those textbooks and then force all our students to buy them. Okay. So sometimes, if I decide I want to use a certain textbook, it's a good textbook. It really spells out the information, and it does it in a, in a, a, a voice that is not patronizing or, or overly intelligent. It, like it finds a good balance. I mean, you have a guess of what this textbook costs, brand new? Yeah, like $400. Yeah. Crazy. So the publisher... I requested this and they sent this to me and there's this big thing on the back that's like this is a this is for instructor use not for resale I think most people would agree if I called the publisher and said hey send me a copy of that textbook and then took that textbook and immediately went over to Amazon and sold it for three hundred dollars most people would agree that was theft that it was that it was morally wrong and probably illegal what happens when they send me a book I didn't ask for part of their marketing and they put a little note in there that says if you're not going to use this book please send it back to us please do not sell it what do you think if they send it to me unsolicited is it mine to do with as I will can I sell it why not But I didn't even ask for it. Am I bound by their note? The right thing. I heard someone else say yes over here. Why do you say yes? Okay, legally. Is there a difference between legally and... Did anybody say it's not even unethical? Like, hey, they sent that to you. It's a gift. Did it send me cash? You're like, that ain't going to happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> what, what were you going to say? Uh, okay. It'd be nice of me to not sell it, but I'm not sure I have a moral obligation to not sell it just because they asked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, there's a clear there's clearly a difference between asking for it and then selling it and not asking for it, I think. I mean there feels like there's a difference just in the like what feels right or what feels wrong. And but somehow when they say like if it didn't say please do not sell, if it was just like here, this is yours to do with as you will, I think almost nobody would have a problem with selling it. But this whole like we're sending it to you for review purposes. If you don't want it, please send it back to us. No, they send you a prepaid label. Actually, no, you have to call them 
to get a prepaid label. I'm like, I'm not doing that. So what happens is I don't review it because I don't have time and I've got a book I like. I stick it on my shelf because I don't feel right about selling it. It sits there as the value of it on the secondary market drops and drops and drops. And finally, guess what I do with it? I throw it away. And I'm like, who was served by that? So the utilitarian in me is like, is the pain they'll feel by me selling it anywhere near the joy I'm going to get? Would you, would, you, would you guess, how much would you guess I could probably make selling unsolicited books in a year? Probably between $1,000 and $2,000 a year. Uh -huh. Three or four or five that are three to four hundred dollar books. Right. So this is why it's a conundrum. Um, it does it does hurt them in the sense that it may be taking a sale away from them of, of one of their books. Although probably someone looking on Amazon wasn't going to buy it from them anyway. They were going to buy it in the secondary market anyway, right? Um, anyway, so that's one, one ethical dilemma that I used to sell them all the time. And then the more I taught this class, the more I thought, is that right? You know, and because I have a religious belief that the sort of the desire to want something for nothing is kind of wrong. Like it's just sort of a, a wrong desire that I, that I should work for the things I get and that I should... Um, or do something of value for the things I, I get, and it felt wrong of me to just be like, but I'll tell you, I see them sitting on the shelf sometimes, and I'm still tempted by them. Um, okay, here's the second one. This is a little loophole I found in the way the college does stuff. Uh, and before the college money was tight, and now we're under all these things where we're trying to trim costs here at the college, I used to always take advantage of this because I thought it was mostly fun to play the game. So, so it when you travel for the college on official college travel, you can either request a college car, and the college has a, uh, um, a relationship with Enterprise Rent-A-Car, where the college will rent a rental car for the, for the day or whatever the days you're traveling for you, um, and then they'll pay you per diem for your meals, and they give you a gas card to fill the car up. Or you can use your own personal vehicle and they will pay, pay you 44 and a half cents a mile. That's the government reimbursement rate. Um, plus per diem for the meal. And you cover your own gas out of that 44 and a half cents. So the 44 and a half cents is meant to cover not only the cost of gas, but the cost of maintenance, right? You're using your tires, you're using you need an oil change. And so it actually comes out to be more money in your pocket if you use your personal vehicle at 44 and a half cents a mile than the rental car. All you get is a per diem if you do the rental car. You get the 44 half cent and a half cents a mile. You pay for your gas. You pocket some if you use your own car. But you're going to have to do maintenance on your car, so you probably aren't really in the end. So I started wondering, how much does Enterprise rent a car cost? So I call Enterprise. I'm like, hey, I want to rent a car, personally rent the car for a day. $44. So I drive to Phoenix and back. What is that? Roughly 350 miles. 350 times 0.445 is $155.75. I rent the car. I take out gas. What is that? Is that right? No, that's not right. That's 95. So that's, we're talking like 60 bucks, roughly. I pocket $60 by following their rules with no maintenance cost to my car because it was swallowed up in the 45 bucks. Especially if I can get a rental car that has better mileage than my car. Now I'm saving money on the gas. So I could, so, so here's how it works. If the college rents the car for me, I get nothing. If, and the, but the college pays for my gas. If I rent the car, I get $155.75. I pay $45 for the car, $40 for the gas, and I come out $60 ahead. So I'm like, oh, I'm gaming this, right? 
So I'm gaming it, and one day I'm talking to my friend who's the controller of the college, and I'm like, did you know? Did you know that people can do this? That's how I put it, right? He's like, they better not be doing that crap. I'm like, well, why not? Well, because it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Either way, I said, I said, hey, if, if I say I want to use my personal vehicle rather than use the rental car, is that wrong? Well, no. And if instead of using my personal vehicle, I borrow my mom's car because my car is not really, you know, I don't trust it going to Phoenix and back. Is that wrong? Well, no. So if I'm using my own car, do you care whether it's my car or somebody else's car? Well, no. So why is it wrong? So the one is sort of a logical process, right, which is I, I'm pretty good at those. But the other is more of like this deeper value-based concept, right? Like you're pocketing college, the college's money. You, shouldn't you try to use the thing that is the cheapest for the, for the organization? And you're like, maybe. Like, like, I don't know, 60 bucks, man, that'll buy me lunch. Right. Whether it's going into the maintenance of my vehicle or into my lunch. Exactly. Right? Honestly, what the college should probably do is just say, the rental cars are cheaper for the college, you will use the rental cars. Right? But they know that there's times when it's inconvenient. And the other thing is, is the big dogs, they all benefit from this too, not in the money. But it's nice to take your own car. Like, like if I have to go on college travel up to, uh, like I've had to go to Flagstaff, my daughter lives in Flagstaff, right? So the college pays my way to my meeting, and then I, you know, on a Friday, and then I take, I stay Saturday, and if I had a rental car, that would end up costing the college more. And so, you know, the rule, kind of, the thought has always been, as long as it doesn't cost the college more, so if I'm getting, going to a travel where I have to stay in a hotel, my wife could come with me. It doesn't cost any more. It doesn't hurt the college. Everybody's fine with that. But this one ends up, it does cost more than if we use the rental car. So the idea is if you needed your own vehicle, we can live with that. But if you're getting the exact same rental car that you would have got if the college had rented it for you, but you're pocketing $60 on it, it doesn't pass my getting something for nothing test again. And I know some people don't agree with that test. Some people would say, what's wrong with getting something for nothing? Caught yourself lucky today because, you know, and another day they're going to take it back from you. It all evens out. That's how I'm feeling about taxes right now. When I was younger, when you when you start having a family and kids, and you get an earned income credit and stuff, and you like pay nothing in because I was in the military, and you get like four thousand dollars back, and you're like, I love tax returns. Well, there will come a day, my young friends, when you won't love tax returns so much. When I will call my daughter and be like, Don't feel guilty about that Pell Grant because they are taking it straight from your dad, right? Where, where suddenly I'm paying 20 grand in taxes and I'm like, don't feel bad about it, kids. All right. So there's my intro. Let's see if I can get this to work. All right. So the book, this book, had a different kind of way of going about it. And the thing is, a lot of times, and if you look at the society we're living in, People just sort of believe what they believe without any thought about it, and they hold on to it dogmatically. That's probably, if you look at like the fights uh, between the right and the left, right? Do you think that it's what most people let, who we would categorize leftist that they would argue that Donald Trump and the Trump supporters are just sort of dogmatically holding to these conservative? tenants without thinking about them at all. I have a friend here on campus, that's what he says. He says, he says, the Trump people are brainless. They don't think at all. But if you look at the people on the right, guess what they say about people on the left? They say, how can anybody believe the things these people believe? They don't even think. They must not even think. So we've got this problem in our society where everybody thinks everybody else is not thinking and just stating their opinion. And I would suggest that maybe some sort of a framework by which we think could be valuable to us. Because that doesn't tell us what we, ha what we have to think. 
It tells us to consider how we think about what we think and why we think the things we do. So they break down these ethics into these elements, arranging values to guide decisions, understanding the facts, and constructing arguments. So you have lots of values bouncing around. Some of them are religious. You were taught, you know, in, in Sunday school or something. Some of them are just values taught by your parents. Some of the things you picked up along the way. You saw somebody who believed a certain way and you liked that. And you said, I want to espouse that, that form of belief. And those personal values then form together in a social setting to where we end up having group values or norms, right? What we expect or believe is normal for that group. But not everybody agrees with those. Would you believe that just 30 years ago that tattoos were viewed as fringy? That people who had visible tattoos were considered on the fringe? That that wasn't normal behavior that people would do? And if they did, they would do them somewhere so they couldn't be seen, right? But that's not the case now, is it? In the military, you when I was in the military, you weren't allowed to have any t tattoo that would be visible in uniform, which means it had to go from a short sleeve shirt. All of that had to be clear of tattoos. Then they started saying, man, if, if, if we don't start allowing that, then we're not going to have anybody because <laughs> more and more young people were getting tattoos in very visible places. Today, would you say tattoos are considered fringe? Or are they pretty commonplace? On the edges of normal behavior within a society? That's almost if you don't have a tattoo. Right. Now, it depends on the culture and the, and the, and the sub-society you're in, right? Among Mormons, as an example, it's still kind of weird. Like, they don't do tattoos. But it's not that unusual to know plenty of people, even within that subgroup, who have tattoos, right? Um, in fact, it's so not unusual that Everybody knows people that have them. But still, and that's a, probably a far more conservative subgroup within, say, the culture of our community here than on average. What I find about this community, and I'm talking like the Gila Valley, is it's not just Mormons. It's a pretty conservative group, even for people of all different religious persuasions. There's some pretty, there's, there are some people who are not super conservative about, say, dress or, 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 or those things. But as a whole, it's a pretty conservative area compared to, say, Tucson. Uh, or or Sierra Vista. And Sierra Vista is an interesting mix because you have kind of an artsy part and you have the military part. Military people are typically conservative, not always in their voting, but often, but certainly in their dress and in their bearing, short haircuts. Women's haircuts are usually conservative and feminine in nature. Like they, that's, that's the nature of, of how the military trains you is toward conservatism. So arranging values to guide decisions happens on a personal level. And then it becomes harder on a societal level, right? Why is political correctness so hard? Because you have people feeling like they're being forced to adopt other people's values, even though most of us agree on the core value behind it. What's the core value behind political correctness? Yeah, or treat others with decency or something like that, right? If you recognize something that you could say could be hurtful to someone, you shouldn't say that because it's hurtful. That's the core value. Treat other people the way you like to be treated, the golden rule. Does anybody here disagree with, you don't have to raise your hand, but does anybody here disagree with that core value that we should try to treat people with kindness or treat people the way we'd like to be treated? I bet nobody here disagrees with that. So why is it that most of us bristle at political correctness? What do you think? If we agree with the core tenant behind it, why do we disagree with it? Not always. We agree with parts of it. But you're telling me none, nobody here has ever bristled at, at, at some political correctness thing? Been bothered by? Well, you know, there's been like all this stuff. Now you explain the course of the same end goal, 
of maybe having everybody treated with fairly or treated the way, like with goodness, and they have different routes of getting there. And that's kind of okay. So it's possible that even though we have the same end goal, we don't agree on the path to getting there. Sometimes I think some of the things that we do in the name of political correctness do not help me uh, respect others more. It just forces me to have to not say this or not say that, which actually makes me, uh, what's the word, resentful, right? So that could be one reason. We don't agree necessarily on the path to the same goal, even though we are both we all agree on the, co the conceptual goal or the idea. Anything else? Maybe you guys have never felt this. Maybe, maybe I'm a generation removed from you. Yeah. I think the thing is just a way that people like trying to convince you have to be political correct is just their way of trying to control society. And I don't like that. Okay, so you feel like you're being attempting to be controlled. Yeah. And so is it your nature to usually buck those things? Yeah. Well, great. You know, okay. And especially not the way I think. Right, because I, I know when whenever the PC police come out, I dig my heels in, unless I can see what they're saying, and I'm like, okay. But honestly, if 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 I said something and it hurt someone's feelings, like and like legitimately, I feel really bad because I'm not out to hurt people's feelings. But I also don't always believe that the things that that they say are PC. Really are, you know or that, they, that it's a really small marginal group of people that we're allowing to sort of drive how we all think about things. Um, but some people would say if even one person is hurt by it. But if we did that, we'd never be able to say anything, right? Um, ASU, um, if a student says, this day is a religious holiday for me, then we have to honor that. OK. And you don't have to be in class today. Because it's your religious holiday. Okay, I can see that. But when it goes beyond that, and suddenly now I have to honor the religious traditions of everybody, that becomes pretty cumbersome, right? At some point, uh, we, we have to be able to function. I'll tell you a challenge. I, I, so I've, uh, I have a Native American student whose family participates in something called a sunrise ceremony. I think that's what they called it. And this thing, like, involves them, like, being gone for, like, a week, a whole week. Um, and I think there was, like, two of them in a semester. And the student was kind of like, you know, can you cut me some slack on, on the schoolwork? And I'm like, I could try, but, like, you're just missing stuff when you're not here for two weeks out of a semester. And, like, good luck finding an employer who's going to be understanding of that. That's a challenge, right? Oh, so, so that's about the only employer that would recognize it is, is a tribal employer, right? So if you were working at the mine, and so, so it's a real challenge, right? Because, because I want to be respectful of, of their religious and familial and community cultural events, and yet I got, I got a class to run. And, I, you know, and so we can find ways to be flexible in work, but at some point, it's not always easy. And so when it's put that way, when a student comes to me and says, can you work with me? Guess what I do? I work with them. Are they? But, but not everybody puts it that way, right? You could, you could miss Friday. But because I know so little of the culture, I kind of just have to take their word for it, right? And there are always those people who will take advantage of that, that ignorance on my part. And so when that happens, then we start to dig our heel in and be like, I'm not going to be controlled. Instead of saying, like, honestly, think about it. If all of us just sort of did, if all of us were just did what was right, didn't take advantage of things, only asked for the time off when we legitimately needed it for a legitimate observance. We probably wouldn't need rules and laws if everybody was just decent, right? 
Go watch Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. If everybody was excellent to each other, we wouldn't need additional laws. So anyway, that was a lot of times on the first bullet point. Arranging values to guide decisions. Taking our personal values, trying to view them in the context of the community or group value, and then allow that to guide our decisions. Because ultimately, we're trying to get to doing the right thing. And that's hard when we don't even agree on what the right thing is. So second is we have to understand the facts involved. In the case you just described, I don't know the facts. I don't really know what a sunrise ceremony is. And when I ask about it, it's kind of like, well, it's a, it's a family thing and it's a kind of personal thing. And, and so I don't have the facts uh, as the person who can sort of grant the yes, you will not be penalized or you, or you will. So when we're trying to make ethical decisions, we've got to try to understand the facts to the best of our ability. So as a boss, you've got to understand what's driving people and what the facts are. I think it's pretty common for us to act without knowing all the facts. And finally, once we have our values sort of arranged in a way that we can consider what are the values we're focusing on here, and we know some facts, then we can construct an argument. Like, it would be wrong to take the extra money because my value, I didn't work for it, I didn't do anything for it, and so it's wrong of me to, to, to take that extra money uh, on that basis, right? So I've taken my value that it's wrong to just try to get something for nothing. I've taken the fact, in this case, I'm actually getting something for nothing, and then construct an argument. Therefore, this is wrong. That's the process by which we kind of take our morals and turn them into ethics. So, in the book, they define morals as direct rules we ought to follow. So I actually said that backward. They actually make it, you know, they're saying that ethics are turned into morals. So I apologize. And ethics are what direct rules or morals should be instituted and followed. On a personal basis, you get to define that for you. In our home, we, it's, a, it's on a family basis, right? My wife and I talk about things. Usually we agree. Every once in a while, there's like a, why is this such a big deal to you? Like, clearly, this matters to you a lot. Why? And usually if we do it in that context, like of legitimately trying to understand the other person, we, we get somewhere. If, it, if it's like she's telling the kid to do this and I get defensive on behalf of the kid, maybe that never happens to you guys, you get defensive on behalf of someone else, and you're like, you know, quit treating them that way, then we don't usually get anywhere. But if later on I can say, so like, like this really seems like it matters to you and I didn't think it was that big of a deal, you know, like, and, you know, usually it goes back to this happened to me in middle school and... <laughs> or whatever, right? So, and then meta-ethics is this more philosophical realm, like of where do ethics come from and do they apply universally? Right? So, this is how the book sort of displays this. I think they should show it in reverse order. We should ask ourselves, where do these things come from? Do they come from God? Do they come from just the order of the universe? Do they apply to everybody? Are all people bound by the same rules? We like that in our society. We want the we want the, the president to be bound by the same rules as the janitor. But not all societies agree with that. Right? Some societies believe certain people are outside of mainstream ethics. That a leader may have to decide when people die or live. But that the average person can't do that. Right? Not all social structures feel about the same way. So where do they come from? Do they apply universally? And then it should go down to ethics. What direct rules should be instituted and followed? So out of all these things out there, what are the ones that we really should be following? Is it the Ten Commandments? Is it the Two Commandments? That's scriptural, right? When they When the... And the scribes asked Jesus which of the which of the commandments is the greatest. He answered with two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. Is that is that are those the ethics that should apply? Should they be independent of religion so that people of all religious backgrounds can feel you know, 
that's a challenging thing for a society. I mean, we grapple with it in our in our country right now, all the time. They're grappling with it in Europe because they have a whole bunch of Muslim immigrants moving in. Can Muslims create zones where they're not subject to the laws of the nation, but subject to their own religious law? That's questions they're asking in Europe. Hasn't really got here yet. Did you know that under Sharia, it's Muslim religious law, some groups of Muslims believe that honor killing of your daughter or wife or a female family member because they've dishonored the family is acceptable. So say your daughter has a sexual affair with a non-Muslim, you could have her, you could kill her by some people's beliefs. Not all Muslims believe that. You should. Or you should even. Yes, you, you have a duty to. Well, so if you have a Muslim community within the United States, should they be allowed to do that? And, and, say, and they wouldn't be prosecuted for murder because it was according to their Sharia law. They're, they're grappling with that in Europe right now. Uh, and that's crazy for us, right? We're looking at that going like, hey, you, you don't kill your daughter. Like, you could get mad at her. <laughs> but if you say absolutely not, then you're down the, going down the road of, well, parents shouldn't even be able to spank their children, right? Which, which is funny because many of the people who, are, who would be anti-Muslim law would be like the people who are very willing to spank their kids. Uh, so... As soon as you go down the rule that the government can tell you what you can and can't do, which we all agree to an extent is true, but once you go down that, that path, it's a slippery path. Well, how much can they tell you? Because if the government can say you can't spank your kid, then in essence the government owns your kid. If they can step in and say this is how you will parent or won't parent, then, and, and actually in society right now, in the, in the United States, the government kind of does own your kid. If they want to remove them from your home, they will. If they feel that your parenting is unfit, fortunately, we have something called due process here. But it's scary because the due process happens after your kid's removed, right? If they came in and wanted to take your kid away, you'd have to go and then kind of demonstrate, no, I'm a fit parent. And yet we agree to that because the flip side of it is, the government would never be able to take a kid out of a parent's home and there are some parents who are downright abusive or neglectful. So you can see how this sort of broad picture going down to the more narrow individual picture creates societal challenges. What I choose to follow isn't necessarily what you choose to follow, but at some point we all have to agree on the basics of what we'll follow and we're going to call those laws and we're going to prescribe punishments if you break those laws. Then the other two concepts they have are what are called normative ethics, which focus on how people ought to act. What is the right way? Right is a loaded word. Versus descriptive ethics, which focus on how do people act. Try to take out the right or wrong. We observe people. This is what people do. Do people lie? Yeah, they're all liars and cheats in some sense. So then we get down to the normative, which says, okay, how ought they to act? Should they lie? Are there scenarios in which lying is normal and reasonable and productive? And are there scenarios in which it's not? The book says these are other factors besides ethics that might, in, might impact how people make decisions. I think that these are other, other factors that inform or dilute our ethical decision making. So prudence means is this thing wise to do or not to do? In other words, I think I don't think you can separate ethics from prudence, religion, peer pressure. I think it informs what we think of as ethical. My religious background and training informs what I think is right and wrong. It informs which of those ethical rules out there I choose to apply as morals. Okay? There's some pretty interesting studies on authority figures. We'll talk about the Milgram study at some point during this class. Fascinating stuff. Yeah? Just, uh, just kind of what you're talking about when I was uh, looking up stuff for that assignment. Mm -hmm. um, I found it interesting because that was like a big part of what people ethically like their moral 
examples are is like the example of buttons. Like a lot of times people pick examples. It doesn't have to be like very like famous people like you and I were like describe to like Gandhi. It can be even like athletes, you know. Mm -hmm. you look at the way that some people act when they play sports, whether it's like very reserved or whether it's very loud and very like aggressive and stuff like that. It's because they've seen athletes, they like that and they try to form their lives like that. So we become like that. For a lot of us as parents for maybe someone who, you know, doesn't want to be exactly what their parents do, they meet somebody else. Mm -hmm. And they try to form their life too. So that Sometimes we see things we don't like in people and we go against that. And it's more complex than even like just parents or not, right? You know, you could have a kid who hates his parents and still does things the way his parents did. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever, right? Now, you bring that up in my mind, it makes me think of the Colin Kaepernick issue right now, right? Where he's saying, I'm being principled. I'm, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stand for the pledge of, or for the national anthem of a country that, that subjugates its black citizens uh, or doesn't give them equal rights. Others say, no, this guy is disrespecting our country and everything it stands for. Um, and now Nike is taking a big gamble on him. I don't know if you saw that. Was, that came out yesterday in the news that Nike's given him an endorsement contract. And in the endorsement, in essence, says, you know, believe in something or stand for something so, you know, so much that you risk losing everything. And again, I know people who are like, yeah, and other people who are like, that's offensive. Right? I saw someone already put out a meme where they, they took Ka Kaepernick's picture out of that quote and put Pat Tillman in it. And said so that's someone who really believes in something and sacrificed everything, whereas other people. And so I think Nike's taking a risk. Are they going to alienate their potential customer groups, or are they going to uh, reach them? Some people. Who's they? You know, ten people do it on YouTube. It looks like a lot of people are doing it. I, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to play. But I think it has a lot to do with these other factors that inform our ethics, right? Our sense of patriotism toward the flag. That's what makes one person angry about it and another saying, no, he's, he, is, he is acting with free speech the way an American should, speaking out against injustice. And most of us are just like, oh, I don't know. All right, real quick. Here's two extreme views about the business world. One is that business needs policing because it is a dirty enterprise featuring people who get ahead by being selfish liars. That's one extreme viewpoint. The other is successful businesses work well to enrich society and business ethicists are interfering and annoying scolds threatening to ruin our economic welfare. Those are the two extremes, right? We're all somewhere probably in the middle of those two. But which is more right? Do you tend to see business as dirty, dirty cheats and liars, mostly, who will take advantage of anything if they're not regulated? Or do you tend to say, let the free market run, and, and it sort of punishes the bad guys anyway? And So do we need a course in business ethics? I used to always tell my students, if your mama didn't teach you right, nothing we're going to talk about in this class is going to change anything, right? You know, which may not be true. I think there are people who, who get thoughtful about why do I think what I do or why do I do what I do, and that impacts their choices. But what do you think? Is it dumb to have a class on this for people who are potentially going into business, or is there value in it? And if so, what's the value? Okay. And does that change behavior? Oh, that was very consequentialist of me, right? To worry about whether or not it would change anything. Yeah. Well, I think I think more so than that is just like when in a business, you need to be open to to at least think of why the person is doing it. Like even the Colin Kaepernick, like I have my point of view, I have my opinion, which is solid, you know. But then. Maybe somebody that's like, hey, well, I support Kaepernick and the fact that you're not doing that for me because you're not speaking for me. You know what I mean? Right. Like, they could be thinking that I'm against it in that way. And really, I'm just very patriotic about the country. I'm going to take it. You know what I mean? 
Right. So you kind of, when you're in a business, in a business world, you have to think of why the people are using your product. Why they're in this and then you want to tell them that they're using it. Good. If you supervise employees, you're going to have people of different backgrounds. If you don't supervise anybody, you just have coworkers. And you know, one of my better friends here at the college is is a is a is a left wing atheist, and here I am a a right wing Mormon. Uh, you wouldn't think we could get along, but we can talk about it. Sometimes we get mad at each other, but you know, once I've recognized that those two extremes are both baloney, and that the truth is somewhere in the middle, and that usually whether it's the media or other sources in the world are trying to sell me one extreme viewpoint or the other, and that they're usually both false. You know, the idea that if you support Kaepernick, you hate America, and if you support uh, the ban against what he's doing, then you're a racist, those are baloney. Those are extreme viewpoints. We're way more complex than that. I love the flag. I love the national anthem. I think people should respect it. And I choose to not spend my money to support people who don't respect it. Race didn't come into that at all. Conversely, he loves his community. He feels like his community has been treated unfairly, and he feels like this is a platform that will draw attention to it. And by the way, he's right. Has it not drawn attention to it? Does that mean he hates America? I don't think it means he hates America. And you could argue that, in fact, he's showing love for America by, you know, but you could also argue that he's not, and that that's the challenge. So I think the, the reason they, they juxtapose this is I think an important part of ethics is recognizing that that most extreme viewpoints are just that. They're extreme. They're on the margins. There might be a few people who espouse those extreme views, but most of us are somewhere in the middle. And if you work with people, which you will in business, you've got to try to understand them. And I think that's all we have. So uh, I appreciate uh, you giving me your time today. Please read through Chapter 8 before Friday, and uh, don't forget to get the homework done for tonight. Have a great day.